Well, I am John King, host of The Drunken Odyssey, and I am joined today by Michael Wheaton, who teaches English and film studies at Valencia College. So we're going to watch one of Michael's favorite films, Children of Men. So we're going to hit play in three, two, one, go. go. And this motion picture has been rated R. So, children, please be warned. Mm -hmm. There's uh, some violence, some drug A use. A disappointingly low amount of sex in this film. Yes. There is non-sexualized nudity. And that's about it. I don't remember the nudity. That's a pretty important part. I won't spoil it. It's a pretty intense spoiler <laughs> if I were to tell you where it comes. Technically, someone's... Uh, all right, we could... <laughs> So why do you love this film? Um, generally speaking, the filmmaking in it. So um, Alfonso Cuaron uses a lot of like long takes. And a lot of the way this kind of movie would normally be cut and shot uh, in order to gain like tension and suspense, he undermines it by employing a lot of just continuous takes without a lot of editing. Um, also doesn't employ very much backstory at all, except for something like this that you're seeing now, um, which is really just kind of a sleight of hand way of, of introducing the setting. Right. right. So here we get Theo kind of stumbling into this coffee shop. We've had the one cutaway to the TV screen, but this doesn't look like his movie unless you know he's the star. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, could be about that corgi right there. That yeah. could be the yeah. It seems like I mean, you're looking at this movie with Baby Diego. You think this is actually going to be like an actual important thing that happens, whereas really we're getting this information about Baby Diego uh, having died. He's the youngest person, so in your brain you kind of put together, well, okay, there's this is the last person born. It's been this many years. It's kind of and, like a build it yourself exposition. Yeah, and so you'll see that technique throughout the film. So there's not much backstory at all, and the backstory you do get. It'll sometimes just be like news clippings on a wall that he'll just kind of very quickly kind of go by. There's a lot crammed in the, the yeah. environment here. Yeah, and so it's a pretty like these compelling <laughs> look at the future. Moped rickshaws yeah. in the future in London. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, one amazing thing about this film is right here in about a few seconds here. Well, you also have a nice alcoholic, uh, despondent hero, which you don't really see too often. I love a good alcoholic hero. <laughs> He's just going to kind of wayward. Oh, there you go. And then you get that big explosion there. And Theo is scared shitless. There's another thing you don't really see out of a hero in a kind of movie like this. Yeah. So look like an armless woman coming mm -hmm. out of the... And that sound you hear right there is, is actually a motif in the film. Yeah. So the I, sound design is also... This is uh, one of the reasons why I don't love the film, Michael, mm -hmm. is this... I, I have t nonstop tinnitus. Since I saw ACDC in, I think, 1988. So <laughs> this just feels like uh, Alfonso Cuaron is just going, yeah, fuck you, John. Hey, take that. Um, <laughs> I, I may be taking it a little too personally. Mm -hmm. Whereas on my side, I'm enjoying the subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, I love the subtle choice. And I'm like, oh, God. He's just <laughs> yeah, so here's a little exposition here as well. But... I mean, I can't think of another post-apocalyptic kind of film that takes exposition this lightly, whereas you usually just shovel backstory and everything is explained and you're told why. Whereas in this film, you understand that there's infertility, but you, you don't know why, and it, in fact, doesn't matter at all to the story. Well, this is kind of like a prosaic Blade Runner in terms of the treatment of environment and exposition. Mm -hmm. I know Blade Runner, like, I think there are, what 892 edits of that film <laughs> so <laughs> oh yeah like the different uh, cuts mm -hmm. right so i mean i think they added exposition in later that mm -hmm. if i'm not mistaken harrison ford read wooden lee on purpose so they wouldn't use it all right but right now i'm i'm distracting from children and men which is uh there you go. So here's propaganda a, here yeah. on the which which functions as the backstory but it's like it's part it's built into the set design you know where it's like usually it's just going to be force-fed to you and it's not really a part of the story as it kind of lives and breathes. And here we've got a great novel kind of motif of a, you know, uh, a guy just on a train thinking to himself and then here uh, 
background becomes foreground. Yeah, and so the graffiti there in the background, like that tells there's some exposition hidden back there. Avoiding fertility tests is a crime, and so like you slowly understand the world in terms of of that kind of exposition, but we're, we're just not force fed it. And then so you can see clearly here how the refugees people cages, right? Which we've seen in history and in uh, contemporary society in different parts of the world. Yeah. Which is really, I think, kind of like one of the biggest things post-apocalyptic kind of... And so here is the star of the film, Michael Caine. <laughs> no, that would be your reading, <laughs> that he is the star of the film. He is the star I'd of the film. I'd say he's probably one of the best parts, for sure. Well, I think one of the reasons why I don't love this movie is there's not much joy. Yeah. There's not much joy. That's what... But Michael Caine... Yeah. And, of course, it's it's the way the character's written, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but plenty of joy in uh jasper here yeah if you were to take jasper michael kane's character out of this film it would just be far too much of an onslaught (laughs) but i'd say like the the film and even Quaron has said that's really just i mean it's really just about hope in the bleakest (laughs) of circumstances uh and you kind of get that toward the end of the movie but even when jasper isn't really a part of it but I would say without it, you wouldn't get an audience. Well, with, you know, Theo, right, he makes the argument at a few minutes here that uh, it was already too late before infertility became mm-hmm. humankind's problem. Yeah, he says, that, like, the world, is, the world had gone to shit. Yeah. Regardless. Hmm, that's and it went to shit before everyone admitted it went to shit. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so he kind of... And... Uh, one of the other things that Jasper does uh, is gives this film more of an opportunity to, to cram some more exposition in. Mm-hmm. He also, yeah, he has access to Theo's past, which is wildly different than the book. Uh, yes and no. Uh, yeah, so uh, I actually love the book. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit more than the film, mm-hmm. but then again, uh, they are completely separate artifacts. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the names are the same. The basic overview of the setting is the same, but uh, the novel by P.D. James, and I found her novel, The Children of Men, far superior to her Fifty Shades of Grey series. <laughs> but I, I think that that book is very much interested not just in uh, in Theo, but also in... Uh, the British government Mm -hmm. after uh, the fall of democracy and uh, the people running the country and here... A bit more substance there, whereas it's mostly left out of the film. We only meet one person kind of with any authority here, Mm -hmm. and that person doesn't demonstrate any of that authority. So here we've got a scene that's either grotesquely sentimental or (laughs) really touching, but Michael Caine has been the caregiver to his uh his wife here uh janice and you really have to study right this this collage here to figure out oh she's probably the way she is because of the torture Mm -hmm. she experienced as a a anti-war journalist Mm -hmm. correct (laughs) boo for ganja being illegal (laughs) Yeah, so I show. It's quite a greenhouse he has back there. Mm-hmm. I show this film in uh, in my classes, in the English classes, and in the film, depending on what we're looking at. But uh, this part tends to make the students laugh a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> They're surprised that I show a movie with this in it. Wait, do you mean English professors might like weed? I, I find that impossible to believe because. <laughs> I don't think English professors are people. <laughs> Very well behaved cat and dog in this scene. <laughs> Is it Although a real cat? That look- cat looks really high. <laughs> of course, it could just be like a dead cat that someone has, you know, mm-hmm. taxidermied into shape there. And I would say one criticism that I would even make of this film is it it does start a little it's slow. It takes a, I mean, without without that first initial explosion. Well, but it does have the initial explosion. Mm-hmm. But, all right, Theo is, yeah, Theo's saying the world went to shit. 
He interrupts Jasper telling a joke to just spew bitterness <laughs> with his friend that he's gone far out of his way to visit mm-hmm. to try and cheer himself what up. an asshole, right? He is. What and it's f- one of those films where, all right, do you think Clive Owen is a lovable asshole? Because there are plenty of films, right, with the, the what, dude around 30 or 35, mm-hmm. 25 to 35, you know, after 35, if you're still this self-involved, then you're just a douche. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if, I mean, if this was Ethan Hawke, I would hate this movie. <laughs> and Clive Owen, I think, kind of sells the lovable asshole. But what do you think? I mean, so uh, you've seen this a lot more than I have. The portrayal of the character is a little, it's not, it's like almost a nondescript performance. Like there's nothing really remarkable about it. And I think that's kind of the point. Like when you meet Theo in the beginning, like there's nothing really to live for. He like, he works his shitty job. He uses baby Diego, his death to just like kind of get out of work. And then he basically just walks around as like an alcoholic who, as you can see here, is just like, oh, life is hard and things are miserable. And then very slowly, through no effort of his own, kind of, (laughs) yeah, this part, through no effort of his own becomes the hero of the film. And, but it's not, it's, it's, he's not really a character that does much. Really, at all? He's that's, very that's close to being interesting. He's very close to being an anti-hero. Yes, but I would even like I wouldn't even go that far. He's not as interesting as an anti-hero. Yeah, right. Like, I think of an anti-hero. I think of like Claude Rains, and <laughs> Casablanca, <laughs> right? But um, so, so the advertisement you're seeing here is for the um, the suicide kit, right? So the government hands out these suicide kits. So I find that interesting in the film because. Every person you see in this setting has chosen not to kill themselves. So as as despondent and lifeless as Theo is supposed to be, uh, he still has chosen not to kill himself. So there's like that kind of there's that seed of hope there for something better. Uh, we got some, yeah. <laughs> and I think so. The the graffiti, you know, the uh, street artist Banksy. Are you familiar with him at all? I'm sorry? Banksy, the street artist? Yeah. He contributed some of the graffiti uh, to this film, actually. I was about to make a joke about how they were ruining Banksy's work, but apparently (laughs) that was more spot on than I meant. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, baby. Yeah, so you've got this society just in perpetual mourning. Uh, All right, so now we're going to meet the fishes. In the book, they're called the five fishes, and they're mm, okay. much more inept and maybe a little more likable. <laughs> or maybe it's just uh, Patrick, the uh, blonde dude with the dreadlocks, who I hate so oh, much. Oh, yeah. You always have to be weary of white dreads, you know? And so, like, even the newspapers here, I mean, if you care to pay enough attention. <laughs> I'm going to tell you some of the details of the world going to shit. Why is she putting him through this? It's a good question, John. I think it's just because it makes a great scene. (laughs) (laughs) That's a cynical answer. I use the word great a little loosely, too. It's not one of its finest... So it's interesting, kind of the overexposures they use here. It's a really interestingly uh, colored film. Usually not including in this scene. You get a lot of those kind of like drab green. You can even see that tint of green here yeah. uh, in this image. Hypothetically, they could be in the Matrix. They could. Uh, in the book, uh, their child was killed when Theo like ran over, ran over right? the child. Yeah. yeah. Kind of makes his redemption toward the end if it's similar in the book. Uh, well, what? All right. So the book, half of it is uh, Theo's diary, and he is a, a college don who is just superior to humankind in a sort of Humbert Humbert way, mm-hmm. so that it's not really like, okay, this Theo of the film might be superior to society 
but it's not because he's any good at all. It's mm-hmm. because society is just so irredeemably terrible. Mm-hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, PD James's Theo is snooty and, and, you know, is uh, a little bit more character to him. Uh, yeah, a, a much bigger asshole, but also there's a lot more emotionally going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is interesting how they kind of bring him in there and scare the shit out of him, and then they just let him out. And we're like, all right, let's just, let's just kind of <laughs> talk about the scene out here for the rest of it. <laughs> but she could be nagging him, right? Um, uh, of course, money is a great motivator. <laughs> And this is never explained, right? Why does he need money? Right. He seemed to have a pretty good job. When you meet his family in a minute, they seem to have a ton of money. I mean, he's working. He knows Jasper. He's really got all he needs. Well, don't say that. Oh, this is... (laughs) That's not true. It never goes away. (laughs) John King is living proof. I hate this character so much. Oh, yeah. He's pretty annoying. (laughs) And what a a cheap joke, right? But I will say that joke plays very well in the room (laughs) with with the students who who are watching it. And it is the humorous moments in this film that actually make it kind of accessible. And there are some things that are funny without Jasper in it, but like we were saying earlier, Jasper really makes the movie watchable, or at least to a wider audience. Well, there's a pleasure burst whenever he's around. Mm -hmm. So, all right, reinforcing the idea that maybe he does need money, he's actually picking up the bus tokens (laughs) off the the wet ground and bending over. Uh, And do you think he's going into the porn shop to spend it here? Or no, he's... All right. I'm a big fan of this scene because they're playing King Crimson's in the court of the Crimson King. Are you a King Crimson fan, John King? Uh, not especially. They're uh, one of those bands that never caught on in the States. So you have to be like a real uh, uh, anglophilic rocker. To, oh, yeah. Is that what I... <laughs> uh, apparently. Well, I, there's, you know, I hear a song like this and I'm like, okay, what... What Pink Floyd album haven't I heard? Because uh-huh. I thought I would have. And there is a Pink Floyd reference coming up. Do you know what there I'm is? About? I do, yeah. I do. So let's talk Very a little British. bit about the music. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. In this film, mm-hmm. because almost all of it occurs when people are actually listening to the characters are listening to the music. Mm-hmm. Like theoret- hypothetically, this is being played in the car. In the film, we call that diegetic sound. Yes, diegetic sound. Uh, and There's in fact, uh, and we'll get a much better shot of it mm-hmm. in about yep. five minutes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, art curation and uh, the helium pigs from the Pink Floyd shows. <laughs> I mean, those are kind of like cheap little, <laughs> cheap little jokes, but. Well, if you're going to be work. a functional alcoholic, you have to know how to push back, Flex you know? Flex your asshole muscles. Though there's really. Not much you can do with uh, Nigel here. Yeah. I mean, and adding this character with his cousin in here is really, I think, just a slick way to show the, 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 um, the class uh, disparities. I can't really think of another reason why to have him, but. Yeah. So in the novel, uh, Theo is actually, his cousin is the warden of England who mm. is running the country. Interesting. So this is perhaps a little more believable, you know. uh, And so one of the things that is really subtle here uh, is that the the young generation, uh, right, the last young people on earth uh, are out of control, right? We saw that when they were uh, throwing all that shit at the train. Mm And we get the rich version of it, which yeah. frankly is what, like a souped up millennial with a, looks, a, a looks, phone. It looks familiar. 
I would say. Is that Guernica behind? That's there? Guernica, and apparently um, they had to pay to use. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> the painting because uh, it actually gets a credit at the end. Hmm. And there's there's the pig. Yeah. And the uh, what do you call those little white pillars? I guess from the uh, Animals album cover, which is a nod to was it Orwell's Animal Farm, I think. So the film is, and I always have the students who are like, why is there a pig out there? And I just say, it's a great allusion to 70s rock. Like, I <laughs> like it's a very conscious thing to put in there, which isn't believable at all if you don't get the reference or it doesn't seem to make any sense. So while I enjoy the reference being made. <laughs> it I might does. be really distracting if it you don't know what it is. It is a bit alienating to yeah. the audience. So, I don't know. I like Clive Owen in this. Yeah, I think he's the right... He's He makes sense for the part. There's not a lot of parts I think, yeah, Clive Owen. <laughs> you know, because you kind of... Like, he does... Uh, he does even very well. When he and plays... He seems to be yeah. a pretty even character. Normally, when he plays really super assertive people, he just comes off as insane or <laughs> creepy. I can't even... In Sin City, all right, he comes off mm -hmm. as like a lovable hero, but in the context of Sin City, <laughs> there are no healthy heroes yeah. in in that story world. So Theo has uh, decided to go along with the fishes after all. Mm hmm So was he, yeah, there you go. Right, because he, he got the transits where he has to accompany, is that it? Yeah. And really, it's just setting up what I think to be is one of the, the best scenes in uh, film in the 21st century, which we'll see in a little bit, the car scene, if you remember that one. If not, we'll see it soon. I can't think of how soon. But. Oh, I don't really remember. It didn't make much of an impression. Um, well, we will talk about it, John King. <laughs> when <laughs> the time I'm comes. I'm joking. Uh, was he blowing all his money at the racetrack here? Yeah, well, this kind of points out what you're talking about, right? It's this Hemingway iceberg principle where Theo is really wrapped up in, in money and um, gambling's just, all right, I don't like gambling. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> Does he uh, gamble a lot in the book? No, no. It's just something they kind of threw in there? No, he doesn't need money at all in the book. Um, well, you know, he's a comfortable college dean. So um, what compels him in the book to, uh, I guess I'll spoil it, I mean, a company and try to get the refugee to safety? Is it just because of his ex-wife? Um, well, I, what's great about the book and the conflict in the book is uh, right. Uh, uh, Theo was actually a council member of the government, but he was only an advisor. So he didn't have a vote and eventually he wondered what's the point. Uh -huh. So he, so in this, he's just like an ex political activist. resigns. Okay. And so here he's a bureaucrat of some kind and you know um, yeah, he's got a well-connected cousin uh, where the Theo in the novel uh, right, is recruited to, to try and have a talk with the warden. Uh, you know, in a novel, you get a lot more space to mm -hmm. roam around and. Naturally, yeah. Uh, and now we're getting. A little sentimental. Uh, but some backstory. I don't know. I think that's nasty. That's not sentimental. What, he had your eyes? <laughs> yeah. Maybe if it was in the book where he ran over his kid, but I think in this one he just they didn't he die just from the flu or something. I don't think we're told. Yeah, I think a little later Jasper tells Key and Miriam. <laughs> How many people have said that to their loved one? <laughs> this is our stop. <laughs> very good. This is like very nineteen forties 
uh, comedy banter. Yeah. So Queron, just as a point of comparing to the book, Queron decided not to read the book. He was shown the, the script or the adaptation and was interested in it, but I forget what it was. Like They wouldn't let him do it the way he wanted or something like that. And then he ended up doing the Harry Potter movie. Uh, the and Prisoner then, of Azkaban, that yeah, one. No one was really into it. And then um, after right. after uh, 9-11, after 9-11, he became more interested in the script and basically said, I'm going to take the idea, completely strip it of everything in it besides like the characters. So there's a baby and, carriage in the garbage. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> that would have been there a long time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. This is 2027. Good point. What the hell is it doing? Somebody just cleaned their garage. They just <laughs> got around to it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Quaron decided to basically sc- strip the script of everything in the book, not read the book, and essentially use it to make what he believed to be a political uh, movie. Well, th- we get the sense that the government is absolutely wrong. We get the sense that the fishes are close to being absolutely mm-hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, the cl- it's a classic uh, um, dystopian thing. Right, you have the big oppressive government, and then you have the rebellious force. But there's that gray area of are the rebels terrorists or something? And so, in the novel, it's more like, oh, well, the fishes are right about a lot of things, but right, but do they go? But the government is also right right about a lot of things, Mm -hmm. and you know, it. I think that's kind of a more dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's harder to dramatize, so it makes for a better. much different medium. Oh, and, and here comes the scene that I was referring to earlier, the car scene here. So this is all done in one take. It's over five minutes. So as you watch it, John, if you think about... Where the camera the is of, and where the camera is Where the car- ca- camera is, how it's there, um, and also how, in a way, miraculous it is that nobody messes up. Now, I have also heard that they are cut, so they're just hidden very well. <laughs> I can't imagine where they're hidden. I have looked, and I, I just I can't find them. Well, one little nifty secret is that ceiling is reconstructed mm. because they built a special car and a rig so that there are cameramen actually above the car. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so that in order to try and... Uh, because there's no way, even a small camera, that you could meaningfully move it like right, from yeah. front seat to back seat, left to right. Right. No, it was int- like my initial thought when I watched this scene is like, oh, there must not actually be a windshield on the car. But then we do see the reverse shots where there actually is a windshield. So, like, how many times, like, <laughs> how many takes did, the, <laughs> did it take for them to get this right? How much practice? Is did there they do? really a, a ping pong ball? Yeah, I don't believe that he they did any. I mean, it's possible not. All right, so here you go. And a lighthearted moment, so time for something really, really awful right, to happen. so that's one of the most lighthearted moments of the film. And the driver the could drive intense. around that shit. He's guilty. Right? You can get we through know it. it. <laughs> well, but there's a reason that even if he could, he wouldn't, right? That we'll find out that's a little right. later in the movie. Oh, yeah, no, it's an inside job. But this is a little bit jarring, right? We're about halfway, uh, half an hour into the movie. Mm-hmm. We're about to see. We're set up. A, there's kind of a love story between. Yep, like a rekindling Julian of the marriage. Julian and now here's, uh, here's Theo. an amazing stunt. Uh, not in this second, but a little later when he comes closer. So here comes that sound again, just right there. There's that motif. Now this is a shock to people when they first see it, especially when I show it to students. Yeah, this isn't where you're supposed to kill off a major right. character. And and arguably the biggest star of the movie. So I also love that stunt there with the motorcycle. I wonder how, like, how do you pull that off? How do you get this glass to break? I don't know. It's really... So when I look at films, like the story, obviously, but if I want a really good story, I, I read a book. Whereas when I watch a film, I'm really interested in the filmmaking and the way that a scene is chosen to be directed or shot. Uh, and the sound done and all that stuff. But again, which is a big reason I enjoy this well, film. I, okay. when, it, when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the technical aspects of the film, uh, I only have one complaint. And so we'll get to that. Sounds good. In a little bit. 
And I think that's that's kind of so, Alfonso Cuaron in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, he's more about the technique. I mean, Gravity. I thought it was yeah, a gorgeous movie. movie, but who gives a shit? Right, and that really, that story is just trite, <laughs> but it's a beautifully made film. That film actually starts with like a seventeen-minute uh, single take. Whereas Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban is a masterpiece. <laughs> Students like this little surprise here as well. And I love how the camera guy gets yeah. out of it. Where did he come from? There must have been a little cut there. <laughs> and I like how this the little the little song on the radio that you heard at the beginning. I can't remember what the song is. It's still lightly playing underneath it the entire yep. time and then all that intensity fades out and you just hear that that little song, little pop song. So, I like how the camera guy stays in this. <laughs> yeah, and the police are dead, and oh, ah, oh, Miriam. Now we're getting some voodoo. Some vaguely new agey kind of. <laughs> Voodoo would actually mm -hmm. be cooler. If it was voodoo, I'd be kind of psyched up. <laughs> I'm with Theo on this one. Uh, I need a drink. Yeah. No, don't put the bottle. More, Theo. You need more. Yeah. <laughs> you got to save some for later. Life ain't no, you don't. Better, right? You'll find more for later. <laughs> I think I would probably chain smoke if... Uh if it was the end of the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Probably the first thing I would do. Maybe that's why he needs the money. He need cigarettes are still expensive. Okay, so this is my technical complaint with the film. Mm -hmm. This uh, gloopy, sentimental choral music, I believe, oh, by mm -hmm. John Taverner. Mm -hmm. This isn't uh, diegetic sound. Correct. And it's like tugging my heartstrings little, and i really fucking hate that and it's like i'm already fucking emotionally engrossed and it's like no no you have to feel it so here's some hallmark music right. and yeah, i'm just i can i can and I can at every important criticism. moment of the film mm -hmm. they bring this shit up and it just yeah like at the end when they're in the prison camp and everyone stops uh, firing during the during fires. what you call the nude scene yes mm -hmm. yep um it bugs me, yeah. uh, especially because, you know, uh, the long takes and uh, also I, there probably aren't a lot of try like this is a handheld camera. Mm -hmm. Why? You what like what is the upside to the handheld camera? Well, a little more raw. It's a little more raw and it feels like uh, a a little bit more like reality TV or a documentary. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so they usually and it's you know they call a documentary style camera. It's you know it it there's a crappy version of this that would look like the Blair Witch Project, which <laughs> I find too garbagey to even attempt to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like ten seconds, and I'm like, no, I'm out. Yeah. No, no, can't, won't. And, and so I, I find this technique just kind of, you know, it, it fills me with a, a good kind of anxiety. And then the music kind of reminds me, oh, you're in yeah. a Hollywood movie. Yeah, because you, you, you use a filmmaking style like this to increase the sense of realism, right? So, which is, I think, is another interesting thing about the movie is you have a, not necessarily a, a totally unreal scenario, but a, a pretty unreal scenario done in a very um realistic way that's just all forward momentum mm -hmm. you know and so i can agree with the criticism of that um non-diegetic music kind of being an intrusion because non-diegetic music would be the definition of not realism <laughs> <laughs> it's a very formal for formalistic element and especially music that sounds like that mm -hmm. um you know well, i like, think it's like holy it's like because there are, there are those, especially in the book, as I've heard, there's like that 
pretty clear like uh religious undertone where like theo's living the christ legend or something like that um but yeah i think it is a little heavy-handed to throw that kind of choral <laughs> music in there well you know theo's a, would be a very ironical christ figure correct um so uh you know the music in uh, i was surprised to find out actually how much music was used in this but uh, a lot of it comes down to Jasper and I kind of liked how uh, right we get the sort of dreamy choral remake of Ruby Tuesday and mm -hmm. which is another motif in the film though that's non-diegetic I believe I don't think it's playing all those times we hear it uh, I think it is right because it's uh, yeah. Jasper's big on his music and yeah. then but when we hear it, we it's hear not because they're listening to it. We hear some, well, it's kind of in the background. Whether or not it is or isn't technically, you know, the, the context of the scene is it could be uh, diegetic sound. So in a case where, uh, you know, I kind of like that he plays that really terrifying atonal industrial music at the mm -hmm. end to just kind of like oh and in case you thought i was sentimental or an old fogey right. like here's some really scary random <laughs> shit i think before that radio heads playing <laughs> all right so here we're about to get our so there's a woman in a barn full of cows right, that's got to be some kind of metaphor right <laughs> that have been mutilated in yes. order to fit the mm -hmm. machines mm -hmm. and then also as we'll find out in a second There is a relation to milk bearing. Clearly. This is nice and confusing <laughs> for students when they first see this one. <laughs> and there's your choral chant. Again, well, not a chant, yeah. but just in case you missed it. Oh. This is, yeah. It's the subtle, hey, this is important. Well, and but not that subtle, I suppose. Is this is, right? okay. And this is such an important moment in the movie Here's where Theo's buying it. Mm -hmm. And right, this is his he is change. in awe. And the music is like slapping you in the side of the head going, hey, you should feel awe because Theo's feeling awe because this is important for the story we're telling, right? Mm -hmm. And that, it's, you know, it's, it's like a... he doesn't trust the story or the mm -hmm. acting mm -hmm. to do its work. <laughs> or maybe he, maybe he doesn't trust the audience. I don't know. Why, thank you, story, for telling me what that's like. <laughs> so that's the character Luke, uh, played by Chiwetel uh, Hilof. All right, I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> uh, so this kind of the way that they're choosing to portray the rebel group as the terrorist group is definitely influenced by 9-11 uh, as I mentioned earlier how that was really Quran did not want to make the movie he, until 9-11 happened and then he decided that it was a very important film to make and it didn't it didn't do well when it came out and kind of now it's getting a renaissance and people are well because people like you are attention. championing the film yeah but like I said, like, and maybe, I'm, more uh, of a, I'm more of the way it's made kind of guy. Like, so, like I would rate Gravity as maybe like a B because the filmmaking is that good. But that letter grade is because the story. <laughs> it's like a D is, story. Yeah. And so it it's must, like at, in a few places, it's like an A story. But for it's like mostly yeah, rocket like a D. It's terrible. It's just a little trite in most of the places. In places, where there it's is, terrible. Yeah. In places, it's good. So kind of, even though we're talking about Children of Men, Gravity is an interesting film because they actually shot the entire film without the actors. And then they put the actors in, which is the opposite of how like a movie like Avatar was made. So they, you couldn't make that movie without a lot of things happening technologically. <laughs> Whereas I think this, this film does a really good job at using the basic technology of the time to just make a, you know, an interesting film, whether it's an A or a B or a C, it's definitely worth watching. I would give it an A. 
personally. <laughs> Maybe an A minus. Well, viewers, you could decide what grade you think it earns. Um, you know, it's if you factor out the John Tavener, I think it's a much different score. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what other movie can you get? King Crimson, The Stones, that kind of death metal, <laughs> and religious religious choral music in the same movie, right? <laughs> There's John Lennon at the end. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, actually, so you know what my biggest criticism of this film is? Is that it's called Children of Men. It should, I feel like they sh should have completely changed the title. And then you just say based on a novel by P.D. James, Children of Men. But it is radically different. Isn't it in the, f in the book, isn't it that um, men, is it men are infertile and not women? And in this movie, it's the I women who are infertile. Both. Um, the, uh, it's called Children of Men because... Uh, It's clearly a world in which man is no longer a child of God. Mm -hmm. With a benevolent God overlooking the whole scheme, mm -hmm. man is looking at extinction. And so what is happening in the world? Oh, look, it's uh, one of the assassins, and it was, oh, Patrick. It's your favorite. Douchebag from before. <laughs> <laughs> and we know it's a British cottage because the doorways aren't big enough to fit Theo. <laughs> He's tall. He's not exactly Hagrid, you know. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, we're going to get a little action sequence here in a little so, bit. And it'll be the beginning of so this a lot of really close calls with death that make the story a little unrealistic, as you'll see toward the end when they're in the prison camp, where he escapes death by inches, you know, so many times. But they kind of bring that up in a later scene when they start talking about uh, faith and chance as like a dichotomy, which I find interesting. <laughs> and you need, you need Jasper to be a stoner in that scene because he says something like, everything is a mythical cosmic battle between faith <laughs> and chance. And like, you can't sell that unless you've got a stoner character. <laughs> Who would just say that in conversation? Well, without being a, what, fatuous git. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, so that he's finding out that that Julian's death was an inside job. The main reason being that they believe Julian wanted to get the child to safety to this human project that they don't really know exists, whereas they believe that if the public were to know about the baby, they would join the resistance and fight against the government. So I think Theo says something like they want to use the baby as like a political flag or something like yep. that. I think he should have just killed him here. <laughs> kill Patrick. Get him. Kill him. Although there is a, a short menacing scene with Patrick later in the film. Still coming up. At yeah. Bex Hill. And now we get to see... Um yeah, how much Julian's advice about Theo is, is worth. Right. Because Key basically blindly trusts him here, right? How long has he wanted to do that to Miriam? This <laughs> now, this may be one of the most thrilling escape scenes in the history of cinema, <laughs> even if it is kind of hysterical. Yeah. Uh, yeah Maybe exactly. because it's so hysterical. There's some of the biggest laughs when I show this is <laughs> when, in the, you'll see, if you're listening, you'll see what we're talking about if you haven't seen the film yet. Although I don't know why you would be watching a commentary on the film if you haven't seen it yet. It would be a bit premature. Yeah. Right, but this car has to be uh, jump-started. Not that yeah, one. Yeah, so they're... Not that one. <laughs> <laughs> I will say at least he doesn't just get in the first car, right? <laughs> Makes it just a little bit more believable. But he's rigging the other car so that they can't... Right. 
chase them out of there so they have a chance to get the hell out of there. Look at you go, Theo. So there's some basic heroic competence here. <laughs> but here you go. Here's here's no music, right? And yep. it's it's so much more tense. Absolutely. Though those points where that choral music comes is not there are not parts of tension. There are mainly parts of release. And to your point, like, do you need the music or do we just feel the release? And I think without it, you would. Here we go. I like how it takes them that long. (laughs) Don't shoot the girls in the car. Like, don't shoot the guy. Though I can understand the reluctance to shoot around a pregnant woman where no one else can be pregnant. (laughs) You got the goddamn rooster growing. Yeah. <laughs> the dog. There's Patrick. There he goes. Uh, yeah, you idiot. Oh, <laughs> uh, the second time Patrick's been taken down by a car door. <laughs> the first time was fucking yesterday. You think he would learn something? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. He's a giant douche. <laughs> He's getting a reaction out of you, though, John. I'll say that. <laughs> the t- fucking sheep dogs. Yeah. <laughs> they just go right by him. Where did the dogs go? And which car was that? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, sheep dogs aren't for attacking. They're That's for hurting true. sheep. That is very true. So they were flanking them, trying to get them, you know. If they were sheep, they would have, you know, been under control. Oh, they would have got them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting back to Jasper. Yeah. You're going to bring the heat down on Jasper, though. Oh, it's so sad. What happens to him? Arguably, one of the most emotional parts of the film. And it, uh, okay, we get that goddamn music again. <laughs> I kind of don't mind you need it something, here. You need something there. You do no, you don't. There. Yeah, I think you do. But I don't. You don't mind necessarily it there. need. You I don't, don't, don't mind necessarily need those shots. I mean, you could just cut, right? But I think it's nice for the pace. Well, I you know. I kind of wish they just turned on the radio and like Buck Owens was yeah. on or something. Uh, that would be. So this is uh, Michael Caine's Bat Cave, I guess. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, he's he's trying to live off, you know, as off, off the, the grid. grid. Mm-hmm. And so they've got the. Uh, the quietest the suicide kid out (laughs) (laughs) poisons the rats that's right (laughs) <laughs> do we get that music again john no we got a nice little guitar riff. that looks pretty good i'd eat that so this is uh the john lennon song that they play loud at the end oh yeah you're right i didn't even remember that at the end Of course, Miriam wants to hear about the UFOs. <laughs> I do like um, 
the debate about the human project, whether or not it exists, kind of going on to the speech he's going to make later about faith and chance, how they side with the option that is the most uncertain of them. <laughs> Though the one that holds out for the most hope. Got to have a little faith in human beings, huh? <laughs> God ain't doing it. So this is so touching that all right, she's eating, right? She's she's not paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. You know, like she might be lobotomized. She just might be so traumatized that, you know. Right. Uh, it's not registering. Yeah. All right. To me, this is the most frightening scene in the film. I hate flip-flops so much. <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, I think Quaron likes uh, humiliating heroes. So, uh we get that nice shot of his feet there. <laughs> Voodoo hoodoo. <laughs> See, Key agrees with me. <laughs> this is a sweet little scene here. Now is Miriam the same kind of character in the in the book? Oh uh, is there more to her? Because I will say in the film, the characters, there isn't the greatest amount of depth to them, right? I mean, Jasper is stoner. Well, there's a lot of characters. And, uh, right, the only the only character who... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Great joke. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really the most we get of key. In the film, like you really don't know a ton about her. Well, you know, this, this is, is really her scene here. This is an adventure story. And so this is, uh, yeah, a rare moment of calm. Mm -hmm. uh, Would you say? Bastard. Would you say? Would you say this is a a humanist film? I feel like it is. <laughs> right, yeah. and like. The pot thing comes back because that's how he knows the the guard. Yeah. So it has several functions in the story where I think when most people see it, it's just like, oh, they're just creating a one dimensional one dimensional character with this kind of shit and trying to be funny. But it really does serve multiple purposes. Well, you know, in a more normal film, you know, um, Jasper might be there for most of the ride, in which case we would learn a lot more about him. Mm hmm. And so uh, the exposition here, you know, what do we know about a Jasper? Well, he spent a very long time caring for a wife who is mm -hmm. mentally not there. Mm -hmm. And he's taking what looks like very good care of her. Mm -hmm. um, and just the amount of love and devotion he's showing and, and kindness, just mm -hmm. never ending kindness. Uh, and here's his faith and chance scene punctuated by <laughs> Theo drinking the strawberry cough thing and, ah. and Theo drinking this is where we find out uh, I believe about Theo's baby and how he died from the flu so Theo's fueling up mm -hmm. but I think this speech here that he gives is really the underlying themes, themes of the film where usually I wouldn't be so into it being that, in a way, blatantly stated. It just makes sense. 
in the film for him to be saying this. And partly, again, because he's stoned, like, you believe it. Well, And he and doesn't know Theo's there, right? So he's telling, we're finally getting this backstory about the baby and him and Julian. Yeah. And this is a very compelling shot to me, right? I mean... Theo is confronting his emotions, yeah. even though <laughs> he's doing it in private. And it's, you know, uh, this may be the quintessential scene in this uh, film in terms of the Not, cinematography. Yeah. And because I'm, we've got him in the foreground. Yes. But the important thing, the thing that makes the foreground important is what's happening right. kind of fuzzy in the background. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's one of the uh, non-action sequences that has probably the most weight. And again, it's just a little, like, just a long take. I and think you put this scene in another filmmaker's hands and they're cutting. They're oh, yeah. Cutting back and forth. And they're making Jasper and what he's saying. Oh, see, I like this. But you know everything happens for a reason. And he says, like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> Which I think is another key part of the film, right? And it is interesting to think, like, uh, so both the people who have access to to, uh, Theo's past uh, aren't going to make it, right? And Mm -hmm. I think when, I'm going to just go ahead and and spoil what's about to happen here, but when Jasper gets shot, there goes our complete link to Theo's past. And then from that moment on, this film becomes, like, just an action movie and all the all the Theo's past is just ir- almost irrelevant until the very end again. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. oh jasper and that's a nice little pan right there right to her and you see the suicide kit right there in the foreground he comes right in like that's beautiful filmmaking and you got the frame within a frame and the ruby tuesday again i don't know i think this is over the top the song the whole thing. Or the scene. I don't know. I don't. What's over the top of it? I think it's a beautiful Him scene. picking up the box and it's like, okay, and that's... But they don't like, show him initially, actually injecting her. Like, this is, and he says, I love you. This is going to cut away God damn it. relatively soon. I think it's handled very well. I think it would be very easy to make this way more saccharine. And again, we're still lingering on that same shot. That's a very well-behaved dog. (laughs) Right? That's a rule in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Don't work with children. Don't work with animals. Unless you make the sandlot. (laughs) (laughs) Well, plenty of people break the rules, but it's... So I find it interesting that they stop here. Jasper would not be pleased. Because we could see this without them stopping, point of view-wise. And it's the fucking fishes. Mm -hmm. And I will happily remark to you, John, that there is no non-diegetic music or or any music here in this scene. No, it ends with a fucking joke. Yeah. And then the gunshots, which are just chilling. (laughs) He's... Goes down smoking his joint. (laughs) Pull my finger. And then they shoot it. Oh. Oh, there is... There is music there. 
I do think this scene would have been better without. I I remember this scene without having that music there in the background. Well, I don't know if it's the Taverner again. It's it's less gloopy. It is than the other choral bits. I love this exchange. Get in the fucking car. He's fine. He's a little mean, but <laughs> rightfully so, I suppose. Yeah, it's I don't mind it as much there. But, but it's, I, it's, it's, it's weird. In my memory, reason. it was not there. I remember no sound and the gunshots. Well, the gun's a lot louder than the music. Yes. Uh, and I couldn't quite tell if they shot his finger off or they just shot him in the hand because it's. I think the first one goes to the hand, and it's then so the next far one they kill him. like it. The the shot is such a long shot that. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're watching this in in high def on the big screen, you might be able to tell. But I kind of hope it's not like he shoots the finger off because that's a little too on the nose. Mm -hmm. Although when Sid comes a little later, we do get that comic relief back before he turns a little later. Before he becomes a less likable character. Yes. There is a, a beautiful moment <laughs> in this scene. Bambi? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> deer was it a deer when the deer runs by i think that's the best comic moment <laughs> of the film because it just could easily not have been in there you know like why i almost you almost think <laughs> why put it in like what would occur wh why would it occur to you to put that detail in but it, it i think it in a way it does make it feel real well but at the same time mix of for world feel lived in but also right, right. there it goes uh, right it's a beautiful creature that's not respecting the man animal boundaries mm -hmm. and uh, yeah if the human race had to go away so that deer could thrive I might be alright with that <laughs> uh, I'm a little more selfish <laughs> you know um I mean, if it was, you know, so the weasels could thrive. All right, maybe not so much. Cockroaches, I don't know. Oh, they're going to live for it. Yeah, I don't think the cockroaches around. need our help, really. No. Um, so here's a little bit of a little bit of a backstory and exposition. And I almost don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. Like... <laughs> She's she's got that look in her eye and that tone in her voice, and I'm like, oh, here it comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Though I think the 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 key part of the little speech here, she says, is uh, something like, uh, "It's like amazing what happens in a world without children's voices." Which, when the film ends and you get the children's voices at the end, it, I think it gives some weight to that choice at the end, which I do think is powerful. But it is a little, it's a little Shakespearean in a way. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, as the because I love Shakespeare. I mean, it's just it's a little too eloquent for for this in a way. Not it, Shakespearean in the sense of like the way that it's written, but I mean its function in the story. As the sound of the children's voices faded from the playground. This is yeah. No, yada, she yada, is. Yada. If uh, if what Bond villains and supervillains do is they monologue, where mm -hmm. they talk about their mm -hmm. evil capers, well, this is like the benevolent version of <laughs> monologuing, talking yeah. about history. And it's not unfounded in this scene, because, I mean, they're waiting, whatever. I do like the image of her on the swing as they're having that conversation. If they just like focused more on her, yeah. it would have been a little stronger. It's not a bad but scene. It's just she's lingering there in the background through that broken glass. Yeah. Like, I love that choice. We, we see again here. You feel as a voyeur <laughs> as opposed to in on the action, yeah. which we so often do in the film. They take those times to back off. Yeah. <laughs> 
Ага. He's got an award-winning laugh, that guy. Yeah, well, one of the things that I admire in my villains is that they enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Sid Kier isn't a clear villain. He's Not a corrupt yet, character. You don't know yet. But he's a corrupt character. Yes, absolutely. But he's doing what he can to take some pleasure out of life. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> very, very bad. <laughs> yeah, Sid's rather attached to his vehicle. Sid likes to talk to him about himself in the, yeah. in the third, third person. person. Yeah, and so when they break in here to Bex Hill, which I believe... Uh, I believe this the rest of the film all takes place here and it's not quite yet, but when they get in, it's pretty unrelenting of a film. Like it just keeps going and it gets pretty intense. And I mean that in terms of the filmmaking is I think it like steps up a notch here. And we get an even longer take a little later. Well, you know, we we've had car scene and I think it might I don't know which scene to say which scene's better, but there is some pretty amazing filmmaking uh, going to be coming up here. <laughs> Sid's really selling it. Even though if he was really selling it, yeah, um, he'd, he'd that'd be much worse. He'd for sell later. it a little bit harder. <laughs> Send me a post. <laughs> So in the book, there are all of these uh, people who've been brought to the country in order to perform something close to slave labor. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they are no longer useful or are unhealthy or are caught doing anything illegal, they are shipped back to where they came from. And one of the reasons why... England is the way it is in the book is uh, and you know this is implied um, earlier in the film of the propaganda right uh, England is kind of still clinging to civilization England where the rest of the world on, yeah. yeah the rest of the world is an absolute chaos and disorder right so people are going to England not necessarily because they know what it's like there it's 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 their only hope right because they're they're, I mean, what I think they pass over what happens to the U.S. in about like thirty seconds. <laughs> but they don't even say what it is. They're just like, "Did your parents die when it yeah. happened, or something like that?" And he's like, "Yeah." And you don't know what it is, but I do appreciate that a lot of the backstory is left to imagination. You don't know why people are infertile. You don't know necessarily what's happened to the rest of the world. But I get you, Miriam's sort of uh, take on that, but. Yeah, it, it doesn't get to the bottom of it. Yeah, you basically just get, here are a few things people believe about what happened, which I find to be a realistic Look way at to handle Look at all that smog. Oh. Nice and dystopian. Well, there are definitely parts where I don't mind that theme that bugs you so much. So the gentleman in the back is probably being sent back because he's sick. Mm. <laughs> and he's right now infecting everyone <laughs> on that bus. Oh, yeah, it starts getting pretty violent here. 
Yeah, well, we have this Dante-esque, right, descent into... Yeah, very true. And uh, and then we'll see what becomes of Miriam here in a second, which is a choice that I love in the film. And, yeah, we're you not don't told, expect it, and then we just lose her very quickly, and it, we're, which we need in the story. We, we I think she has served her purpose. And then that's basically it. Which is probably why she gets that speech in a couple scenes earlier. Yep. Looking back on it, it's pretty obvious now. Well, if we don't dwell on her a little bit more, yeah, then... <laughs> so, now, what I think is interesting, he's looking at Theo, who's clearly English. Yeah. Like, he's not a refugee. <laughs> like so. But if you're with them, then you're not with us. Right. And then, yeah. <laughs> See, now that there's there's a scene I think you could do without the coral in the background. When she gets bagged, I feel like it's such a much more. Yeah. Although it's, it is an interesting counterpoint, but whose counterpoint is it? Usually in counterpoint music, it's, it's with, it aligns with a character and how they feel. Usually the, you know, like the most, uh, cited case is like singing in the rain in a clockwork orange <laughs> well in the in miriam's case right she's the most religious person in the film yeah and uh it's true right but i mean if, but if if our last image of her is she's got a black hood over her head uh, and she's gone i feel like yeah it could be a little without the music that works for me, but that's kind of indicating mm-hmm. that we should not regard her religious views with any dignity <laughs> at all. I will say, I never thought, I ne- that never bothered me until you mentioned it. Now I can't help but notice. <laughs> now, every time you now, every time it comes on, watch this, I am wondering, think, do, uh, did, do we need it? I, like I said, I do think there is a nice counter, uh, a counter it provides. Yeah, no, I, did, not, I didn't mind it so much there. I, I could do without it. I did mind it there, but it's, I wouldn't have noticed it before. So I've converted you. <laughs> Not wholly, John, but I definitely am noticing it a little more, where it's more powerful and where it could have been dropped. So uh, dogs are uh, important in the book in that uh, pet reproduction is uh, closely monitored because ah. right, obviously if, if cats and dogs were allowed to breed indiscriminately, well then it would just be a menace. Interesting, yeah. Uh, a pestilence on the land and... Uh, This reminds me of my honeymoon. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. Uh, actually, here kind of is, you know, um, if we're looking for, you know, uh, Christ analogies, this yep. is kind of the scene that's coming the closest. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, I think they have it worse than Joseph and Mary. I'd like to watch side by side. <laughs> well, which that films have that words, in it? Uh, I can't think of one I've seen. All right. So a lot of the characters in this film seem a bit flat. Uh, you know, they, they don't get to reveal themselves through action an awful lot because they just don't stick around. Mm-hmm. Theo is the only kind of clear focalizer throughout. Uh, but what I find really amazing, yeah, it, they have to pause the birth because the dog hadn't left yet. I just <laughs> find that kind of amazing. It's kind of like, you know, in the westerns, yeah, I want to see the sheriff fucking reload. 
Yeah. Every time that happens, I'm like, thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you. Now I can believe in whatever right. bullshit you're going to show me. Right. Uh, but uh, Marichka, the gypsy woman mm-hmm. who's kind of their uh, docent <laughs> in, in Brexhill, is uh, uh, going to come back. It does seem she's in quite a bit of labor compared to two minutes ago. Well, you know about film and the compression of time. Mm -hmm. Not to speak of her compressions. And, okay, this is how you know how seriously he's taking this. He's pouring his whiskey onto his hands to disinfect them. Mm -hmm. Good thing he had it. This is, okay, this, right now, this moment, not the baby, but him pouring that w- liquor, that's his character arc. Mm-hmm. It's this, I mean, and it's after the baby's born, it's a pretty sobering, <laughs> pretty sobering journey he's about to undertake. Does that happen in the book, out of just curiosity? Is there that detail in there? Uh Oh, there's the baby. <laughs> oh, it takes him a minute to cry, which I think is a really great thing they do. And the fucking you're left music. In that suspense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Of, like, if that baby, baby was stillborn, you're like, uh, oh. Yeah. And you know it's not, but this would be the the worst movie <laughs> if that baby were stillborn. <laughs> And uh, just so that you know, the scene is important, Michael. We've we've got the music again. The uh, John Tavener. I think it kind of makes sense here. No. <laughs> That'll be the end of that discussion, right? <laughs> I'm not having it. Because it's low enough in and the mix. He's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> And this is, and he's still wearing the flip flops. Oh, this is so funny. That's frightening. right. I forgot about. That. Oh, because he loses them later. Yeah. Steps on some shit. I hate mornings like this. <laughs> what the fuck is Sid doing there? That's not good. Good thing the and baby's not crying. He's dressed like a refugee. Right. Why? Oh, and that's why. So he can help get him out. Of ah. And that's a really subtle thing where he says the army's going to blow the whole thing up. And when they do escape later, there is that scene of the bomb being dropped. Yep. That goes by unnoticed a lot of the times when people watch it. And here comes his... But Sid's already been paid. Why is he coming back to help them? That's very true. He must have really liked Jasper. (laughs) That's the best reaction. (laughs) Jesus Christ. All right, I, all right, Michael. I'll, I'll accept that answer. He really loved Jasper. <laughs> you know why? Because Jasper got Sid. He did. <laughs> and that's how Sid would have thought about it. Jasper gets Sid. <laughs> oh, tell me he did not shoot that dog. There's the dog. Okay. <laughs> I'm still on board with the movie. So you think Sid knew that there was a baby there before he went no, there? No, 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 no. Like he got it out of Mar- Marika? Because like she starts saying that he's bad. Because Marika knew that she was pregnant. Oh. Uh, but Sid didn't. No, because he was genuinely surprised at the baby. I just forgot why he was there. Oh. That's why Sid goes back and gets him. 
It's not to help them out. He just tells them that. And he's going to go. He thinks there's a reward in turning them in. Ah. So he all becomes clear. <laughs> all right. Sid, maybe don't shoot the gun till you have a shot. Oh, yeah. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> Marichka, is, she's a badass. She is. She's like a 60-year-old gypsy. So here, I think... She okay, just clocked the shit out of Sid. from this scene is, and I think you said this before earlier, like the other day when we were talking about it, is likely the reason the movie was made from a technical standpoint. Oh, uh, this is... Because this it's is got to be a contender for one of the best set pieces in the history yeah, of cinema. absolutely. And I think it does sway how I view the movie as a whole. Well, I am and, a firm... And the story, in addition. Because <laughs> it is... I think it's about 45, 30 minutes left, maybe, in the film. And it is... It is we got 30 20 minutes, minutes left. Like I've seen. Although, I guess you could compare it... This is great. To, like, the beginning of Saving Private Ryan. Or, <laughs> yeah, right there with the battery. <laughs> Usually he's still wearing the flip the flops. Students, everyone in the room goes, ah! Oh, yeah, it's so like, there you go. But, yeah, Sid is a soldier, and he gets clocked in the head because he he's just dumb. <laughs> I can barely fit anything out of this door other than my head. Right. Okay, let me stick my head out. Right. When the guy knows I'm coming out there to kill him. All right, there we go. You got to draw it out. A fucking <laughs> boat. Yeah, a little bit of emergency pictionary here. And See, so this, this is, is the feasibly the uprising, I believe. That it's horse. hard to tell where did that horse come from. Yeah, I have no idea what any of that is about. Um, you know, because uh, that's not the fishes. That's that's not the human project. It's the uh, well. So I believe the so it's got soldier, the troops have been sent in. And the prisoners are going to be battling against the troops. So they're kind of creating their own uprising. Little do they know that they're all about to be <laughs> bombed, even the, even the soldiers. Well, if you have no other choice, right? you know. Yeah, and so this is, I presume, the Russian mafia. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot about this scene. Right, who are so right barricaded there. in, you know, uh, in, in, embedded in, in where they're at that uh, they've just got all their they're kind like of protected. Possessions. I love the candles for '88. Nice orange. Yeah, so we got some. Kind of nice old rolled furniture here. An orange that I presume in this economy costs about a million dollars. <laughs> Persian cat. Do not let that cat get outside because it will get so yeah. unbelievably filthy. Yeah. <laughs> ah, shoes. Those blue shoes are the only thing that makes the next <laughs> oh, shit. The next sequence believable. Yeah. So the set piece hasn't There's officially cheap. started yet. No, not yet. I spoke a little too soon. I forgot about that scene. Wow, they actually, those sheepdogs uh, uh, from the farm have yeah. really done good, great work. They've they travel far. They cue, oh man, they cue this the set piece right here with the sound, with the music, the screeching of the violins. 
some old school kind of pentrecky squealing. Yeah. So if you're watching at home, just look for a cut because you're not going to see one for a while. And I know there are some films that have tried to duplicate this for the whole film, not quite believably. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need more of a purpose, mm -hmm. maybe, or I don't know why I thought Hardcore Henry would be a better one. Oh, here's fucking Patrick again <laughs> with those goddamn blonde dreads. So this is a scene, I think, a while ago. I was The guy who shot Julian is yeah. all bitching about his fucking cousin. Asshole. <laughs> this is where Patrick is scary. And he starts singing that song as he's, like, shooting. We'll see it in a few seconds, I think. Now, that'll be an interesting point to talk about when it comes when the people see the baby. So the fishes are expanding and trying to run this thing called the uprising? Yes. So I guess you're supposed to get the idea that all those people we saw earlier fighting against... The, here's, here's where he's... This part terrifies me. And then that's it. <laughs> that was it. That, that three seconds there. That one sticks in the mind. Yeah, so they and then they believe that when the people see the baby they'll fight harder, whatever that means. And bless Marichka, she's protecting that dog. <laughs> Dragging it around like a a meat purse. <laughs> meat purse. Yeah, and so <laughs> <laughs> he looks genuinely scared. Yes. Like, it's not like I'm a badass. I'm going to walk down right. the street. Well, that's what I like about the hero in the film is he's never like, you know, the, you think of a Hollywood hero and this would be the opposite. Okay, the time to Could've go the other yeah. way. Like, oh, it's he Patrick should have died again. right there. So this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's just so many moments where he escapes death there. So this blood. Someone got shot. Here. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually a mistake in the filming process. Yeah. That Quiron, I read this that when the blood splatter happened, he yelled "cut," but uh, because of the, how loud it was, no one could hear it, and so they <laughs> kept going. And then it was like. It wasn't uh, Luz Becky, the cinematography. It was somebody else that was like, shut up. That's like a miracle that that <laughs> happened. You just let it play out. And they say it was like the one of, the, it might have been the last opportunity they had to get this scene right in one take or else they would have had to do it another way. It feels very much right, like, a, so like a video game. We've just learned what happens to people who surrender. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now we also learn why maybe that's what happens to people who surrender is they got more people still fighting upstairs. Yeah. Here's that sound, John. Yeah, the Do tinnitus. You. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's terrifying. You know, Michael, Seven for those about to rock, you. we salute you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and that song has these weird <laughs> arpeggios that are just uh, got some great graffiti. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the set design is like, who, how could you? I just imagine somebody setting this up. The bodies laying there, all the stuff perfectly disheveled. There's Patrick again. <laughs> I don't think he makes it out of this scene, does he? Yeah, 
There, there go. he goes. There you go, John. <laughs> Is that your favorite part in the movie? No, wasn't satisfying. <laughs> You can suddenly hear the baby crying. No, and this is... Um, I don't know how I feel about this. What's that? Uh, well, you know, Theo, he's chasing that child and he's chasing Key. And maybe he's doing it because Julian trusted him. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's doing it because this is the only meaningful thing he could be doing right. with his life that he's already like miserably depressed with right so if you're gonna die you might as well if dive he's... saving the future of humanity so this is a bigger cause than you know His killing alcohol. patrick who killed julian right 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 i think luke's here yeah We're cutting again now. I don't even know how long we have been back to cuts. <laughs> but I feel like that's how you know, like a scene's pretty good. They started cutting a little while ago and I didn't, I didn't even, yeah. I didn't even and I'm looking for them. And I, you know, it sucks me out of uh, Mr. Like analytical mode. I love this part. He said it's a girl. The gunfire stops for that, like, <laughs> unbelievably stops for, like, that few seconds, perfectly timed. With a moment you could only have in the movies, you know? But it is it is a beautiful little moment there in the film. Oh, and he just shot Theo. Because it is, it is women who are infertile, and then she, or, sorry, women who are infertile, but now potentially this baby could be fertile. Whereas if it was a if it was a boy, the baby would not be nearly as valuable. I don't know. Don't you need two babies, preferably from different people? <laughs> science is if pretty, repopulation is science is pretty good now, John. You can, <laughs> you can make that baby pregnant. Not the baby. Sorry, <laughs> you could make eventually <laughs> the adult the child in the fullness of time. Yes. yes. All right. So here's. We'll get the music returning. Right. So oh, I think here's geez. Quaron kind of injecting his philosophy on humanity here. Right? In his belief that as people see the child, they will stop fighting. Whereas the fishes believe when people see the baby, they will fight harder. Quaron says, no, people are better than that. <laughs> Which is an interesting point of debate. So that's one of the, when I use this in English classes, this is one of the scenes we focus on the most in debating. Does humanity stop war <laughs> amicably because there's a baby there? Well, now we got the British officers, and we've seen them mow down people who are surrendering. Mm -hmm. Nobody tries to take the baby from them. People are just or, kind of like basking in the miracle of it. See, there are the soldiers who, yeah. <laughs> what do you think, John? Does that happen in real life? Well, this isn't real life. Right. What are your thoughts So on humanity? I guess I'm asking you a pretty deep-seated question. Oh, we're John. fucked. <laughs> uh, that's, that's my philosophy. My, uh, thought, my thought is no one notices. No one would notice. I think they'd be so self-involved in their firing of guns and continuing the war that... Well, just the crying of a baby is so freaky in this <laughs> environment. Yeah. And mm -hmm. actually, uh, I do like this film. And in this moment, they stop the music and we just get to see all these soldiers in awe. that the possibility that life could go on. Mm -hmm. And then they bring it back for you. And then they bring the <laughs> music back just in case we... Are, <laughs> 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 Suddenly everyone gets a little Catholic. <laughs> that guy has a cold. I don't... I, that's... <laughs> Yeah, 
You know, like that's what I want. Do they let them go? Like, I could see them being in awe, but do they seize Theo and Key and take the baby? In a way, the soldier is saying, like, no, we must protect it. I almost feel that. Well, might be what actually. It's not, not part of a soldier's job to retrieve right, a baby, especially true. if that you know, you weren't told. Right. That's very true. So they're through. So we're getting very near the end here. Now, why isn't anyone here? That's another thing I think sometimes. I guess every the war is concentrated to a specific part of the. Prison. Well, it's uh, well. There's that. You know, this is. Um, not a, a a big waterway so uh you know it's I get the only the, exit though you'd think there'd be more people well but as brex hill um you know water authority this is like escape from new york right this wasn't a refugee camp built to be a refugee right, camp this right, was right. a city right that was adapted oh god damn it <laughs> there's that music again uh, all right like if it were Motorhead rather than this, <laughs> you would like it better. ZZ Top. I would. I love ZZ Top. But Lita I, Ford. I would. I would hate it. <laughs> Grace Jones. <laughs> if he just started playing uh, Tush right now, <laughs> it would be better. Can you imagine the counterpoint going on? <laughs> it would be. It might be amazing. <laughs> They made it, and now they... And there's all this garbage in the water. Mm -hmm. So, of course, making it is not going to make you feel any better either because you don't know if the human project is real or if the boat's real. Well, we get some answers. We do. One of the things that happens to me... So, I'm 46, and when I watch a movie, even a pretty good one, I often get bored. I, I've just, I've seen scenes like this before, mm -hmm. like just mm -hmm. years of movie going, mm -hmm. like it's hard to keep my interest. And this is a, a movie with big concepts but that takes the filmmaking very seriously. And the running time is about an hour, 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, with the credits a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. So and it's a good thing. All right. right. They should have brought Marichka with them. That poor dog. <laughs> that, mean. that poor dog. Yeah. Uh, so one of the reasons why I give Alfonso Cuaron such big points for this film. All right. We find out. All right. This is a, a this is just a cliche. Too like, redemptive uh, for you. Too obviously redemptive. I don't I mind that. it because he got me. <laughs> it's like the, maybe the worst line he delivers the whole movie. He got me. The the movie is so short. Mm -hmm. Normally, self important movies. Yes, and I mean that in well, a good and a bad way. I think it's sh it's short because of its all forward momentum, and it's not going to weigh you down with the bookiness of the story. The exposition, you know, is uh, as you've told me right it's it's in the scenery it's in the background and there's some a, a little in dialogue but i think that some of the bigger points are hidden but you uh any gets to teach you some parenting skills before he there dies you go, yeah. just like han solo <laughs> maybe not uh, see I, I love this image here so the brevity of this film to me as one of its great strengths. Yeah. Whereas if this was like, normally with a film like this, it'd be like an extra 40 minutes long yeah. and it would just drag. Mm -hmm. And so even the moments I don't love, they don't drag. Yeah. So he's, he's very economical about. And I, I appreciate that in storytelling, especially these days. And I would say, especially in short stories, I appreciate that momentum because it's so easy not to do mm -hmm. it. And I, and I, a million people could probably debate me on this, but I find that the uh, feature-length film and the short story have the most in common between the mediums. 
And it's not the novella and the and the feature length film. It's definitely not the novel. But I find the short story uh, to be m- more closely tied to at least how I what I want out of a short story <laughs> are similar things that I well, want. Well, the TV show is more like the novel, right? Yes. Or a continuous the scope story of seasons, yeah. Or maybe ten a or thirteen hours a of a, a season mm-hmm. is closer to a novel. Yeah, and then if you turn this into a show, you'd get all that world building and stuff like that. Where in a film, you don't need to do it because you can see it, right? Like you don't need to build the world if I can see it. Like I understand it intuitively. So Theo's dead. Theo's dead. The boat comes right on cue. We are safe now. That's premature. Correct, right? Because who knows who's on that boat. But she would probably believe that's what she would, you know. Although the boat is called tomorrow. and mm-hmm. I love how they do mix in with, even though the choral, the, the lullaby she's singing to the baby. Uh, I, I do find this smash cut right there. That smash cut, they cut early of it. When my students see it, half the room is like, what? That's it? I'm so, I'm so pissed. They are upset that the movie ends there because they... Yeah, Most well, of the what happened to Voldemort? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the fun, what I find interesting about that is... Based when, very loosely on the book yeah, by right. P.D. James. But that's what I'm saying. Like, it should have a different title, in my opinion. I think it is a significantly different... Well, it does, because P.D. James' books is The Children of Men, oh. <laughs> and this film is <laughs> Just, Children of <laughs> Men. Excuse me. But I, fi- I find it the interesting... The definite article completely changes the whole flavor of they the title. They should have called it A Children. <laughs> it's just completely made it confusing, grammatically. <laughs> Uh, but what I was going to say is I find it interesting that when I end up discussing the ending, <laughs> the, the ending of the film with the students, they find it, it was a satisfying point to end it. But the smash cut is so unresolved that they feel it and they're like suspicious of it. But it's really just them feeling what Quran wanted them to feel, which is an unresolved feeling. To they wanted a fade ending. to black, That's not nice. a jump to black. Right. And there's your John Lennon song as the credits roll. Yeah, I'm, all right. I'm going to say it. I don't like John Lennon. That's another podcast, John. Well, <laughs> no. I, all right, let me go back to what Jasper said. Uh huh. Lennon McCartney mm-hmm. is an extraordinary thing. Mm. Interesting point. I still think Lennon himself is great, but I do not uh, necessarily enjoy Lennon's solo work as much as the Beatles. That's for sure. Well. I'm a, I think I'm a little older than you. Mm-hmm. So I grew up with people who would insist John Lennon has integrity and Paul McCartney is a pop music sellout. Uh-huh. Is this song going to be our test <laughs> as to whether or not John Lennon writes mm-hmm. happy jingles right. or not? Mm-hmm. Um, every crap song you can dig up that McCartney made. Okay. Silly little love songs. Yeah. Pretty. Yeah. Uh-huh. Although the beginning of that song is so fucking weird that it almost cancels out yeah. that it's the most dreadful pop song in history. Yeah. <laughs> but you can find equally dreadful John Lennon yeah. solo songs. Uh, and what I, I, I don't care that they hated each other or mm-hmm. loved each other, but couldn't cohabitate right. in a band together. Yeah. It was that tension trying to find some way to make music together mm-hmm. that made them great. Yeah. And so John Lennon by himself, there aren't a lot of songs that I love and the people who worship him. Now, having said all that, my favorite Beatle is Ringo. <laughs> so I'm not even saying, oh no, I'm a Paul You're McCartney guy. Not a... Well, I'll say, I guess we could tie this into the film. There's, a, there's in a way with Quaron's movies, a Lennon McCartney at play where he employs the cinematographer Emmanuel Luzbecki, as far as I know, in all of his films. And I, and I might argue that the best thing about Quaron's movies is the cinematography. <laughs> uh, so I, know, you know, I don't know how much to credit Quaron and, or Luzbecki, but it is widely thought that Luzbecki is, is the genius <laughs> behind uh, this film and, and the way that it is done. Although well, Quaron, f- for hiring him, they were like uh, they were uh, art school buddies, like film school buddies when they were kids. Well, and you know, we're trying to talk about this 
you know, film is such a collaborative medium, mm -hmm. uh, right? And we've talked a bit about the way the novel works and the way that the film works, but there are five people credited on the screenplay. So just trying to figure out, like, okay, like... That's usually revision, they do that? Who made... Yeah, oh, yeah. No, like, someone did a first draft, right. and then... Somebody else finished it, Quran had his hand on it, and somebody else was like, meh, or a studio guy was like, meh. Someone could have done punch-up, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but it's just kind of a, a fool's errand to say, oh, well, the, you know, this decision got made at, at which point... Right. Right. Especially as, as you indicated, some decisions are accidents that just turn right. out to be cool and you leave them Especially in. Especially in filmmaking and sometimes in writing. So, all right, final thoughts? I feel like we had them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got to keep talking. It's Why, not over you're yet. still running? Yeah. <laughs> There's the credits are rolling. God, Absolutely. this is a great credit sequence. A plus. Well, I think Neil Pearson did a wonderful job as the accounts cashier. <laughs> the construction management in this film is... Insane. I still think this is Michael Caine's movie. I I think it's Emmanuel Luzbecki's movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wholly support your love of Michael Caine in this film. Well, uh, Greg Proops calls him movie helper. Every movie he's in mm -hmm. gets better because mm -hmm. he's in it. Yeah. Um, right? I, I think uh, those uh, uh, the Batman films made by uh, Nolan, Christopher, Christopher Nolan. Nolan aren't good. Really? Really. The Dark Knight's not a good? No. Oh. Now I don't know, man. The movie's pretty great. Start to finish, really? Mm, it's long. Not just it's, that. It's not without criticism. But not I just would that. Definitely call it a, a, a good Batman one. is like the worst character. <laughs> so, all right, Heath Ledger. But don't you, but don't you like a, a dominating villain, though? Not because the hero sucks. No. Mm. So no, Heath Ledger like is electric. Yeah. But Batman is a pretty one-dimensional character. I mean, it's kind of like... No, he's not. Is, right? No one has managed to do it on film well. That mm. doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's the character's fault. Well, I shouldn't say one-dimensional. I should say he's... Two-dimensional. Yeah. But... Uh, Correct. Michael Caine as uh, Alfred makes it just a little bit better, a little bit more palatable. Mm -hmm. uh, even though like it's there's not a lot there to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think people love those films because they weren't simply unspeakably stupid films. Yeah. There's a lot you can sink your teeth into. There's definitely ideas in those films where they didn't typically exist in in the Batman films. And the and again, the filmmaking of those films, especially The Dark Knight. Well, all of them really. It's pretty incredible the stuff that Christopher Nolan does. Though I'd say my biggest criticism of Christopher Nolan since the movie Memento is, is just like cut 30 minutes out of each one <laughs> and you might have a, a little bit better movie. But I do, I will say I, I enjoy, there's not really one Christopher Nolan film I don't like, even if I don't love one or two of them. <laughs> so one interesting note about uh, that, what Fragments of a Prayer, the gloopy, sentimental mm -hmm. choral music mm -hmm. that I hate so much, recorded at Abbey Road. Oh, bringing it home. <laughs> there you go. Now, f for those of you playing along at home, and I found out that Jeremy Irons was playing Alfred, I want... Oh, and they actually used some Pendrecky there. I thought I was making a joke. <laughs> Turns out I was right on the nose about uh, Pendrecky and the sort of squeaky, and I think we're... Back to the fucking prayer music. Oh, God. <laughs> Got to end it on that note for you. Fragments of a prayer for this movie to be over. For Annalisa, Boo, and Dolmo. <laughs> there you go. I like the kids' voices coming back there. Probably what stock audio footage of kids just. I want, yeah, my guess. 
I don't know how you legally get the sounds of kids just goofing off. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. I've never stayed to see that there. It uh, means peace in uh, Hinduism, according to... All right, get right up close to the mic. So, excuse me. Shanti in uh, Hinduism means peace, according to Google. Well, that may be a bit preachy for this film, but on the other hand... All right. It is a pretty, I'll not be a dick it is and a pretty actually say film like Quaron, whereas I don't know if his message if his message is as political as I think as he thinks it is. <laughs> he set out to make a Well, I think it's political a politically film. engaging film. I don't know that it has a I clear has political message. Right, and I think that it in discussion that comes out though it's not necessarily in in I was going to say the text, but in the pictures. But uh, a prayer for peace. You know what? All right. I'm not going to crap on that. Yeah, that's, right. that's a good way to end this movie. Why not?